what we need to know or what we need to know about Buddhism if we're interested in Buddhism or we consider ourselves Buddhists most of us know about bowing, offering flowers saying prayers to the Buddha and so on many of us may notice that this is a ritual and religious part of practice but uh, which is auspicious but which does not bring much chance of transformation and so I'm not going to talk about that at all and what you need to know in Buddhism is apart from that which is basically to teach you about the history and about the Buddha and his attainments and about revering him and what it was he attained there are two higher uh, companions of practice of being Buddhist and I'd like to go into those instead so beginning with we split the whole thing into two things the first is the Pariyati Dhamma Pariyati Pariyati Dhamma, the theoretical uh, academic study of the Dhamma, of the undeniable facts, which is not a religion, it's a science, it's Vichā, uh, which when you begin to test out in the laboratory of your own mind and your own heart, test out the experiments of the Pariyati Dhamma, of the teachings or of the if they are teachings to those who are learning them but actually apart from teachings beyond teachings they are undeniable facts so I shall call the Dhamma undeniable facts and to really truly understand and to know how to apply the practice of what the Buddha taught and what he had attained and what he taught was how to attain what he had attained which most people call enlightenment not knowing of course what it is he had attained what enlightenment is what, what is meant by that word so you must first know the following of the Pariyati Dhamma of the, the knowledge of the truth the undeniable facts and after the second part is the Padipata the applied practice and that applied practice is practiced through certain meditative contem meditative practices uh, combined with contemplation of the previously mentioned Pariyati Dhamma of the teachings of the undeniable facts of the truth the true nature of things and so you take first the Pariyati Dhamma and learn the Pariyati Dhamma of the true nature of things and of existence and then you practice the Padipata, the applied practice of mindfulness and meditation and jhana absorption and you use what you have understood from the Bariyati Dhamma to test if they are true, if they are undeniable facts or not so you use the Padipata, the practice of, in contemplation of the Bariyati Dhamma to attain confirmation of those undeniable facts and when you confirm them through your own inner experience you attain awakening to those truths and you will transform because real, full realization of a truth liberates you from the illusion which was previously there before you came to see that truth so the Bariyati Dhamma the main topics which you need to understand to be able to practice the Bhadibhata are such the Four Noble Truths the Three Marks of Existence the Five Aggregates Atta and Anatta Self and Not Self this concept you will need Jhana the Four States or some say Five States of Absorption which are meditative states where you forget yourself you forget, you slowly shed yourself of different levels of feelings which are obstacles to the next level of absorption until you reach the final state of formless absorption then you need to know the subject of sati and sampachanya sati means to be attentive and aware and conscious of 
your actions, what's happening, what's being said, and to be skillful through that very high attentive conscious and main consciousness that is the sati. And sampachanya is the effort, the applied effort to maintain yourself awake and attentive to what is going on on a subtle level to remain skillful that is sati and sampachanya. And you would also need to know what is the Noble Eightfold Path, which is a long thing to study and understand in itself. You would need to study these and know these topics. And I'm going to explain them. You would need to know about, the, after this, what is Vipassana and the 40 Vipassana methods. The four Ikipada are the principles of um, success, but there are four principles of successfully, uh, not success in business, success in your path of conquering your own heart and becoming enlightened and not being enslaved to your instincts. So those are the four Itibada. You would have to learn those about what they are and how to attain them. And the six Apinya, the six Apinya, six supernatural powers and you would also need to know about, I think I mentioned, the five aggregates. So, we need to learn these before we can get on to the second part, which is applied practice of Patipata. So, beginning with the four noble truths. Four noble truths are something that one would have to confirm and accept and understand subtly to be able to call oneself a Buddhist. It is, I would say if there is a requirement, this would be the first requirement. And uh, four noble truths, satya, jatu satya, the four truths, meaning four realities or four truths. And that also sajja means something else. Sajja is one of the ten paramita, one of the ten perfections, but that means complete truthfulness, so you complete purity, that you would be completely truthful, and that uh, bodhisattva has to develop sajja, one of the all ten, that and the other nine perfections to become a Buddha. But the four noble truths are uh, the following. Uh, dukkha, uh, unsatisfactoriness, or that things are unsatisfactory, suffering means suffering, dukkha, stress, or unsatisfactoriness, or suffering. It's the first noble truth. The second noble truth is samutiya, which means, uh, samutiya means uh, there is a reason, there is a cause of suffering, because all things that uh, are are not without cause. All things have a cause. All things are the effect of an earlier cause. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, samutiya means the core of suffering. The first noble truth is dukkha. If dukkha exists and suffering does exist, ultimately we all have to die. So that's undeniable and we get old and ill and lonely and no friends and everybody dies around us and then we get sick and die. It's sad and we can't change it. It's impermanent. And so that's dukkha. And dukkha exists, so if dukkha exists there is a cause to dukkha, which is samutiya, the second noble truth. There is a cause to suffering. And the third noble truth is niroda. Uh, niroda means the cessation or the extinguishing of suffering and uh, so there must be an end if all things that have a beginning have an end and therefore even suffering itself had a beginning had a cause and it therefore also has an end and that is niroda to attain niroda is to extinguish our suffering. So there is an end to suffering. If there is a possible end to suffering, niroda, the third noble truth, then there must be a way 
a path to end or a method to end that suffering and that's the fourth noble truth that the way to end that suffering is makkah which means the path and this means the noble eightfold path which is one of the other things all Buddhists who wish to practice and follow in the footsteps of the Buddha and to become liberated and enlightened must know about should know about so dukkha suffering samutaya the cause of suffering nirod or niroda the uh, end of suffering or the cessation of suffering and makkha or mak in Thai makkha in Pali means the noble eightfold path which needs detailed explanation so the way to if you accept suffering exists that there was a cause and that there is also a way to extinguish the suffering and liberate then one should try out the makkha and if one tries out the makkha as the way to attain the cessation of suffering and its causes because that is the way is to destroy its causes <coughs> then one should learn the noble eightfold path <coughs> Sorry. Now, to learn the Noble Eightfold Path, one needs to practice vipassana. Vipassana. Uh, to attain the Noble Eightfold Path, you need to practice vipassana, which is categorized into 40 different sections of practice. Actually, it's one simple practice which develops itself like a snowball rolling down the hill. But academics, when they split it all up and write it down in a book as different categories of practice, then it looks really complicated and off-putting. That's why it's best to actually practice and then learn about them sometimes afterwards because then you say, oh, that's this thing what I did, or that's that thing what I did. But anyway, it's important to know if you wish to really advance and to understand every facet of your practice and to apply your practice well as the Buddha taught so vipassana would be the way you use to attain the Noble Eightfold Path to attain and to use the Noble Eightfold Path to attain arahantship, enlightenment which I will say now is not about being a cosmic magician or something it's much more about being completely innocent and pure like a baby so whoever thinks it's some kind of Superman power thing, power trip, it isn't. So it's much to do with purity, because that's part of what happens on the way. The logic of it comes to you, where purity is actually the goal. Magical powers and supernatural powers happen to arise through the effort and diligence to renounce all temptations and to remain pure. That in itself is a supernatural power is the truly supernatural thing because to read minds impure people can develop the meditative ability to read minds of others that doesn't make them a super person because they haven't conquered their own heart but a Buddha is pure he might have developed that ability might have happened just through his sheer concentration in renunciation but that wasn't the goal. They just, you know, some people know how to dance, but they never dance. They don't have to. So, um, one of the basics before even getting to vipassana, whilst after learning the four noble truths, then one would also have to to confirm the four noble truths. In truth, you would need to also have, perhaps previously, learned the three marks of existence which is anichang tukhang anatta anicca uh, transience, flux, impermanence, change nothing is forever uh, tukhang dukkha which is the first noble truth in, um, unsatisfactoriness due to the, uh, the, the first 
Mark of existence is impermanence. The second mark of existence is dukkha. Anicca, impermanence, dukkha, uh, suffering. And the third mark of existence is anatta, not self. So my body is impermanent, it's changing, gets old, sick and dies. I myself am clinging and attached to its youth and its health. And I don't want to die and attached to the idea that that is myself. And because it's impermanent, as it changes, I experience suffering through it because I cannot accept it. And that is the second mark of existence. The suffering arises because of the impermanence, which is the first mark of existence. And because my youth and my health is out of my control, I cannot make it remain it has to slowly fade and disappear, as do all things, then it is also not myself, it's not part of me, it's not under my control, it's not mine, has no owner. My body has no owner. It is not mine to command. And so it is not self. And also not self, the third mark of existence, is that every feeling, every mood I'm in, every character mode I'm in, in each moment, as I change in time, from moment to moment, from mood to mood, from thought to thought, from mode to mode. None of the people who are, arise in those particular bubbles of a moment, of a mode, of a happy man, a partying me, a sad me, a conscious me, a completely lost in thoughts me, and angry me, they are impermanent, they're like bubbles, they pop. And it's just a series of chimeras. And there is no self which survives it unchanging. It's completely changing and like a boat on the ocean or like a flickering candle flame, it can never stay still. And not, none of those moments survive. They all disappear and give way to the next moment and the next mood and the next character mode and the next moment of feeling like this or like that. They're just like little drops of foam on the ocean that keep separating and melting back in again. And one moment disappears, giving rise to the next moment. One thought disappears, giving rise to the next moment, to the next thought. One feeling rises and fades away and makes space for the next feeling to arise which will also fade away and so on. One event passes by to give rise to the next event and so on. And that is anatta, non-self. There is no permanent self that travels through all the moments and remains indestructibly unchanged. And that is the three marks of existence, anicca, dukkha, anatta, impermanence, um, unsatisfactoriness, slash suffering, and not-self, anatta, anicca, dukkha, anatta. You would then need to know, to be practicing Buddhist, about the five aggregates. Five aggregates are five dimensions of existence which some of which we are conscious of and some of which we are less conscious of which happen within us all the time and uh, we can also become some even the things we are conscious of we can become conscious of on a much more subtle level of these five aggregates when we are practicing the Badibata later we need to when we are doing a meditation and things happen disturbances happen or the things that happen within when we're trying to meditate we have to notice what the phenomena is that is happening whether it's a thought a feeling or whatever uh, whether it's an obstruction or a help in your meditation you have to see which, mm, where in the five aggregates within you or which of the five aggregates or if more than one or if only one of them is in effect when you notice something in meditation. So if you notice a thought, or the thoughts are in words, or if you notice a feeling, 
or if you notice that a feeling has made you change your mood or you notice that a feeling, a sensation you got or a little vision you had or a mosquito biting you or a fly on your eyebrow while you're trying to meditate you might notice the reaction and the emotional reaction or you might notice the physical sensation you would have to say, okay, these things I'm noticing, where are they happening within the five aggregates? Your psyche, some people in the West say, West say the psyche. The psyche means your mind, your feelings, your, uh, your inner sense, your physical sensations, your psyche, everything you're aware of, everything that composes you, your existence, your, your body and soul. So you would know the five aggregates. And the five aggregates are called the five khandas in Pali. Or in Sanskrit, the Hindus call them skandhas. So yo yo people who practice yoga and have uh, Hindu gurus will call them skandhas. In English you call them the five aggregates, which means the five heaps or the five piles uh, or collections or groups, aggregates. Uh, we we'll call them like kind of categories, and so there are uh, there are five aspects or elements which constitute and compose a living being in your physical and your mental and emotional existence on the on the realms of your feelings, your thoughts, and your actions, uh, the spiritual, the mental, and the physical realm. So the five aggregates are basically root or in Pali, in Thai, rup, in Pali, rupa, which means um, your body, and the, your body, your physical body, or also it means physical forms, other bodies too, the, the material, thing, material things in the material universe, and uh, including your own body. The second aggregate, or the second kanda, is in Thai we call them Khan. The second Khanda is uh, Vetana. Vetana in Thai. Vetana in Pali. means feelings or sensations. Vetana actually means uh, emotions. And I would take it more accurately that actually what an emotion is, is a reaction of pleasure or displeasure or complete uh, don't care, complete uh, neutrality or apathy to something. And so the, the emotional sphere is the second kanda, the second aggregate, vetana, vetana. That means your reactions. The third kanda is sanya. And sanya is often known as mental formations. Actually, that's uh, but as perceptions. Sorry, got that wrong. As perceptions, so sanya it does mean perception. A perception, if you haven't already meditated and examined these kandas, most people will see perception, the word perception, as oh, I'm seeing this. Uh, let's say I'm seeing this plate of food in front of me. That's not the perception. That is your vijnana, that is your consciousness being aware of the plate of food and telling yourself you're seeing it. But the transmission of the data of light photons hitting your retina, being translated and reaching your brain and re recreated into a holographic image, that is sanya, that is the transmission of the data and that is the perception. Sanya means the transmission of the information and that is the third kanda, the third aggregate. Some people will also use the word memory, so perception and memory. Perception means the, the act of the data being transmitted or tran uh, transported to your brain. You haven't become conscious of it yet. Perception is not conscious. Perception is a process of things traveling along your nerves. And it's not just the image through your eyes of a plate of food. It's also 
a cigarette burning you on your foot will transmit uh, signals. Yeah, signals. Sanya means signals, the signal, the transmission of the signal. And so Sanya can be the transmission of a signal of pain, can be the transmission of a signal of visual imagery, can be the transmission of a signal of sound waves that you might might become music when it hits your brain. But it's not music until you make it music, you decide it's music. And so and before that it's pure raw data, it's binary, it's quantum data. But, but you can, through all of your physical senses, and even through non-physical senses, through your imagination, you can receive sanya, which means a perception. And when you receive perception of something, with that third kanda, sanya, third aggregate, you will become aware of it. And you will have a reaction. You will like it or dislike it. Liking or disliking it is an emotional reaction. And that's the fourth kanda, uh, this emotional reaction. And being aware of it is the fifth kanda. You might become aware of it, the fifth kanda, before you get an emotional reaction, which is the fourth kanda. So one, two, three, four, five kandas. They don't follow each other in that order. They're just listed as five like that. But which comes first when events happen inside you? Perception, the third kanda. doesn't matter if it's third or fourth, how you list them. Perception, the kanda of perception, will transmit pain to your brain, which is still rupa. Your brain is rupa, the first kanda. And then when the transmission of the data of the pain hits your brain, your brain will make your fifth kanda, vinyana, Vijnana means consciousness, and that's the fifth kanda, aware of it. The fifth kanda become, is conscious. You become aware of the pain. When you become aware of it, your thoughts will say, this is pain. And as soon as that is, the fourth kanda, sankhara, sankhara, the five kandas are rup, form. I slipped just a minute ago, sorry. Rup, rupa, form. Vetana, feelings, sanya, perception, sankhara, conditioned things or thought formations, and vinyana, vinyan, vinyana, consciousness. We take the third kanda, sanya, perception, transmits pain to your brain. Your brain makes your consciousness awaken. You become aware of the pain, vinyana fifth kanda. When you become aware of the pain, then your thoughts form. Sankhara, the fourth kanda, conditioned things, conditioned thoughts say, oh, this is pain. Yeah, um, You say, I don't like pain. And when you say, I don't like pain, then vetana, the second kanda, feelings or emotions, reactions, also happens in chain series. Yeah. So that is also that's an example of how you would try to see the chain of events when you are meditating to try to see oh this thought that just popped up disturbing my meditation it popped up because I became aware of a mosquito biting me and when I became aware of the mosquito biting me I told myself that's a mosquito and it's biting me. And then I said, I don't like that, because I had memories of malaria and memories of bad things, things I considered to be bad. And all of that conditioned my Vetana Kanda, my second Kanda, my emotional Kanda, became conditioned by the thoughts, and they were motivated by the thought, and they arose. And so the emotion, the reaction arises, is, Ah, I don't like that. I hate that. Anger. Dislike. Suffering. Anger is fire. Fire is hell. And all of that happened in one little chain of thoughts. A bit of pain hits the brain. The consciousness becomes aware. It wakes the 
mind that thinks in words of. The mind thinks in words and conditions that whole abstract sensation into something it doesn't like based on memories of previous experiences and then triggers the emotional sphere of one's psyche, the emotional candor, the emotional aggregate, which then also sets a ball of rolling into negative emotion and reaction, and then things start going haywire. So, the five aggregates. So, the five aggregates... Just had to switch off then, I pulled the cable, the microphone out. The five aggregates were uh, Rup, I say in Thai, Rup, Vetana, Sanya, Sankhan, Vinyan, in Pali, Rupa, forms, or the body, or all forms in the material universe. Vetana, emotions, reactions, feelings, sensations. Not awareness of them, just the sensations themselves. Sanya, perception and memory, or transmission of uh, data to be perceived. Sankara, the Sankhan in Thai, Sankara in Pali, conditioned things, which might mean conditioned thoughts, but actually it means table is a conditioned thing. Actually, it's just what it is. But in our minds, our conditioned thoughts, we say that's a table. Actually, the table is never a table. It's only a table in our mind. And so table is a, not a thing. It's a conditioned thought in our mind. And it's illusory. But it's necessary to communicate with, with each other in the world. And some people don't accept the, the supposed assumed reality we need to be able to communicate and they will say that's not a table although they still think it's a table inside they still see a table and so that's also insanity you have to accept the imaginary world and the quantum world that lies behind everything the nibbana world the world that is not conditioned and the conditioned world so sankara is conditioned and the fifth aggregate is vinyan consciousness which an event when an event happens something just bit me mosquito just bit me um, the event of a mosquito biting you only happens when awareness arises and awareness of it disappears later there is always an awareness of something but what it is you're being aware of that is being known changes they just burst like bubbles they burst and burst and burst and burst and that is anatta also that's also non-self i just like to interject that that because we're our mind constantly constantly throwing one thing forward after another there is no person that transports between those moments there's just one moment goes away and the other moment happens and there is no self that is traveling between them surviving them all there is just what is you don't need a self to perpetuate being here and experiencing things and that is part of the subtle meaning of not self the not self nature of things things are but they are without having to need to be some kind of unchanging self so five aggregates Rup form, vinya, uh, rup form, vetana feelings, sanya perception, sankhan conditioned thoughts, formations, and vinya awareness of something, consciousness. And I think uh, the only other thing one would really need to know is about perhaps the jhana the four states of absorption complete absorption in four different levels one above the other where you shed obstacles you shed various states up to the third state of absorption happiness or a rapture is allowed to be present but to reach the next stage the fourth formless state of absorption the sense of rapture or pleasure which is based in the idea of still being a self has to disappear because you need to completely be 
lose the sense of self and centrality and separateness to be able to enter into the fourth level that's an example of one of the things you would have to shed analytical thought is another in the first levels of meditation analytical thought is present and can be present and is applied and it is later shed and so the, the, the four jhana states of absorption come from meaning to shed each level until all that is left is a pure unconditioned state where you can get insight momentarily into the unconditioned nature of things and if that can be attained then insight into the true nature of the true Dhamma, the true nature of all things can be attained and the true path and way to attain liberation becomes visible and attainable so that is what one attempts to attain is the, the Arupa Jhana that is perhaps the core of the core goal of the the first thing you should need to attain to gain insight and um, one would have to also know about the the Nivarana, the five hindrances which are five different kinds of mental hindrances such as doubt and sloth and torpor uh, which keep you keep you which present themselves along the path as you are developing they have their moments where they become strong hindrances and stand in your way and you have to face them and conquer them one by one so one would have to learn what are the five hindrances and how to overcome them which is that needs each of these things needs a long uh, discussion a long talk for themselves I will leave out the four itipada the the four itipada the principles of success except to say in their basics they are uh, uh, chanta which means chanta means to having a zealous heart means to be very very interested and in applied in what you are going to do to be uh, if you that make sure you like it and that you think you can uh, you have to be committed and the second one is wiriya the second of the four principles is wiriya which means with ultimate effort applied effort the third is uh, commitment to commit yourself to the task dedication concentration to maintain your focus on it to not let it slip to not yeah to not let it slip sampachanya to maintain effort women saw and to use circumspection wise investigation to often examine the cause and effects and pros and cons of things the gains and the losses in things and to evaluate them and use the results of your evaluations to improve your skillfulness so to use those you would have to learn about those the four itipadas which are method recipe for success in your practice so I'd say that's about all you need to know and that you will need the five indriyas the five indriyas are the five faculties to have mastered to be able to become a Buddha you can only become a Buddha after mastering the things contained within the concept of the five Indriya but each of those is, is massive in itself because just one Indriya would the first Indriya would be to complete the seven Bodhipakya uh, the, the 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas and uh, the second faculty would to be able to complete the four samapadana the four samapadana means to avoid uh, not create more bad karma by avoiding any unskillful actions now and in the future to remove bad karma of the past by committing skillful 
auspicious acts now and in the future to uh, maintain good karma c accumulated in the past by not committing inauspicious acts and unskillful acts now and in the future and to increase the good karma by committing good acts as much as possible now and in the future to do those four things which means to do good and not do bad basically but to that's split into four ways of looking at it so to completely avoid ruining your good deeds of the past by going and doing bad deeds again and to keep your good deeds of the past good by not doing those bad deeds again and to um, get rid of the bad deeds of the past and make more good for the future by doing good deeds now and in the future that is if you understand karma then those practices will also be necessary for you to be constantly conscious of and let them condition your behavior throughout your life and so I would say that's the basic needs of what a Buddhist a person interested in knowing about the Buddha and the Dhamma the Buddha Dhamma should know as to do you need to pray do you need a Buddha statue do you need some incense do you need to light candles and listen to some music I don't know you can do that if you want it has its uses and it will keep you mindful but I would say that uh, all of the other things I've talked about in this talk which are all going to have a talk each of the different concepts I've talked about in this talk are going to have their own individual talks so this is also an introduction I would say uh, all these things are much more useful than um, the religious practices of celebrating uh, historical events of Buddhism and lighting incense and praying to deities and so on which of course is a different ma matter but today I didn't want to speak about that I wanted to point directly to what the Buddha taught which was basically a, an esoteric practice or a yogic practice and meditative practice which requires lots of effort it needs both academic understanding and it needs also applied effort with yourself you don't need to ordain you don't need to do anything you just need to try and to learn and understand the methods so I would say uh, in my opinion the things I've tried to talk about and tried to explain I don't know if I've succeeded or not or to what extent are much more useful than the burning of incense and uh, making offerings which are by all means do it's definitely uh, good and not bad but if you wish to transform your lives I would say uh, take an interest in the things I've been talking about in this talk and this is John Spencer for the Buddha Magic Project once more until the next episode of these talks signing off <laughs>